Are there viable alternatives to the Big Bang? Do we know where the giant impact happened? And does a smart telescope ruin sky gazing? And in Q&A Plus, should you be excited about Project Hail Mary? Mink Deems asks, do you miss the knowledge that the actual photons from the stars are entering your eyes rather than just from your phone? If you buy a telescope, like, you know, I always recommend the Dobsonian, that you will take your Dobsonian and you'll set it up and you'll point it at the moon and you'll be like, I cannot believe what's going on right now. I am looking through this telescope and I'm seeing the moon. I'm seeing craters. This is amazing. And then you'll watch night after night as the the phase of the moon changes and it's just like every night is this new adventure with the moon. It's incredible. And you look at Saturn and you can see the rings around Saturn and you look at Jupiter and you can see the, the bands across the surface of Jupiter. If the telescope is strong enough, you can see the great red spot on Jupiter and you can see Mars and you can see the ice caps on Mars. And then you can make out the crescent shape of Venus. And then you can see Mercury as this little dot. And then you can see Uranus as this blue dot and Neptune as this blue dot. And then if you live in light polluted skies, that's about all you can see. And then if you live in darker skies, then you can see some really cool star clusters, you can see some globular clusters. But the, the nebulae and the galaxies are the fainter objects. And through the eyepiece, they never look great that at the very best, you're like, I can see a fuzzy, hazy blob in the telescope. And that is the Grand Orion Nebula, right? I can see this sort of hazy blob. And I know that's Andromeda, the Andromeda galaxy. And yet if you capture some photons, if you do long exposure, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, you know, your eyeballs are throwing out their photons every few seconds do a long exposure. And suddenly you see all of the features, all of the details, all the stuff that you just can't see with your own eyes. So the question is not if you will eventually switch to doing astrophotography, it's really just a matter of when that once you've looked at the the planets and the moon, once you've looked at some of the brighter deep sky objects, you're out of targets, right? Like the universe is not putting more planets in front of us. So once you get a camera on your telescope, then you can look at 5,000 objects, 10,000 objects, weird nebulae, star clusters, and galaxies and in all different configurations. And so it's really a matter of like, if we could see those things with our eyes in telescopes, then people would never need to, to do astrophotography unless they were like, really, they wanted to share the view with other people. But it's just that at a certain point, you do this long enough and a telescope just isn't good enough. When you look through a pair of binoculars at a bird, and then you take a picture with a camera of a bird, you're, it's kind of the same thing, right? That you saw the bird and then the camera took a picture of the bird and you show people and yeah, like maybe you took a picture and the bird was doing something really interesting, flapping its wings or grabbing a fish or whatever, right? But you saw that with your eyes. It's not like that in astronomy, that what you see with your eyes is not what you can see once you take a picture. So, so really, you do both. You get a small, inexpensive telescope that allows you to see the moon, the planets, some brighter deep sky objects. And then you switch to taking pictures because that's, that's the part where the that's where the, the hobby becomes the rabbit hole. Greg Lance, I always had doubts about the Big Bang and all matter originating from a single point. Why didn't more astronomers previously explore alternatives to the Big Bang prior to Webb's discovery of distant galaxies? So there's a lot going on in that comment that you just said. So I want to kind of dismantle this bit by bit and hopefully then reconstruct your question or at least sort of your understanding of, of the situation. So the first thing is the Big Bang does not say that all of existence came from a single point, a singularity. That is a misnomer. And it's unfortunate that that misnomer is out there because it's stuck. And so now people like you, and even me a, while, a little while ago, uh, sort of thought like, that's really weird, right? Like, how could you have this infinite universe somehow be compacted down into a, a point that is infinitely small in size? And we actually talked to cosmologists about this. They say, no, no, it's not that the actual full infinite universe was in this singularity. It's at the observable universe, the part that you can see the sphere around you was once dramatically smaller, possibly as small as an atom, definitely as small as like a grapefruit, 
right? But that was just a tiny part of the actual full universe. And so right beside that grapefruit sized observable universe, moments after the Big Bang, there was another one and then another one and in three dimensions, as many as you can go, an infinite distance. And so the universe was infinite, sort of before the Big Bang happened. And then the universe is still infinite after the Big Bang, it's just that it's becoming less dense over time, right? So there wasn't this all matter originating from a single point, just that everything was a lot more compact. And now it's a lot less compact. Now, why didn't astronomers previously explore alternatives to the Big Bang prior to Webb's discovery of distant galaxies? So Webb didn't discover or see any galaxies that are like farther than what would be predicted by the Big Bang. It has observed galaxies that are surprisingly larger and more mature than what a lot of the sort of mainline theories were predicting. But the sort of full scope of the theories about cosmology, sort of those observations fit within those theories. So nothing has been completely shockingly discovered. It's just that, you know, if there's a scale, and you're like, you're expecting, most likely, the observations to show up right in the middle of the scale, they're a little this way, that they're bigger than you would think. But it wouldn't it be weird if they were like a little smaller than you would think, right? It's all within that scale, but all that scale fits within the current sort of modern cosmological models of the universe. But there are people who have alternative theories about the universe, who have been jumping all over uh, these, you know, the new data are coming in, and people are quite excited about this. And people are using this as a chance to uh, promote and push their pet theories, and theories that most people won't take seriously, people, you know, they can't get their theories published in journals, or they have tried and, and they don't get a lot of, of traction, because they make predictions, or they fail to make predictions, or they make predictions that don't match the observations. And so they have to be discarded. And instead of discarding their theories, they just wait for the next sort of mild controversy in astronomy to jump in and say, actually, our theories are valid. And here's the reason and blah, 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 right. And you're seeing a lot of this. And that's what you always see. We saw that with the Hubble Space Telescope. We're seeing that with the DESI survey. We're seeing that with James Webb. This is the thing that always happens. Like you can you can set your watch to it. And yet, there are plenty of very legitimate scientists who are proposing all kinds of alternative theories about the early universe that, you know, although the scientific consensus is about the Big Bang, even inflation, and the cosmology and all the kinds of evidence, the lines of evidence, because the lines of evidence are very strong, that the evidence that has been seen so far really supports this idea of the Big Bang. But there are plenty of people who are proposing different versions, whatever, and that, you know, if they fail to make uh, predictions, or people fail to make observations that match, then their theories are just kind of like lost. Or are they just sort of sort of sink down into history, as opposed to the ones that make interesting, you know, predictions, and people actually see those things. So this is just part of the cycle. You know, whenever you get a new tool, like web, you're going to discover things, you're going to you're going to uncover new mysteries. That's just how this works. And that they are going to put strain on your existing theories. You know, this is why we have the Hubble tension, the crisis in cosmology that the expansion rate of the universe at different times is not matching what we'd expected. That's exciting, not predicted, still fits within the current models, but but maybe new physics need to come to help explain this. And so now, scientists are working really hard to try and figure out what those new physics are. So yes, astronomers are constantly challenging, critiquing, attempting to overthrow their existing theories. Because the easiest way to disprove a theory is to find a counterexample, right? If I say that it never rains on a Tuesday, and then on a Tuesday, it rains, we can now throw that theory out, right? I can't say it never rains on a Tuesday, because one time it rained on a Tuesday. And so that is the process is that you go through this, you're trying to disprove your theory. And the longer the more your theory resists being disproven, the more you cannot you're unable to disprove it, then the more sort of probability that you should give to that theory of being a rough approximation of reality. And then as soon as something better comes along, you switch to that better thing, because that is the rational thing to do. 
It's time to shout out our new patrons at the $5 level and above. Resk Monk, Wojcik Grabjek, A. Walsh, Christoph Kruger, Dirk Dernstein, Steve Smith, Michael V. Brown, Angus of Medicine, and Hitch Hawken. Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. King Tad 1136. Do we know where on the planet the Earth? Not that I know of. Like, I know that the interior of the planet is not completely evenly distributed, that there are anomalies in the shape of the mantle and the shape of the core. And you wonder, like, are those all the way back to the collision that caused the moon? But it was a gigantic collision. Like, it was an object the size of Mars crashing into Earth. It liquefied the Earth, and the debris was liquid and then formed into the moon. And so, you know, are there lasting scars? Like we don't see it on the surface for sure. Uh, you know, we don't see examples of craters that are that old and that big. The processes on the surface of the earth are too rapid, right? We have plate tectonics, we have erosion, we have all kinds of weathering that happens across the surface of the planet. And so even very large craters are wiped away over geologic time. But is there a scar left over from, you know, internally? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. That's interesting. KGS, why do space photography videos always come with that spiritual ambient music? So although I hate it, I've been playing around with Sora 2 just to understand the technology to, to understand the enemy. And I was having it generate space videos. And then I was also just browsing Sora 2 for space videos. And they're all this ambient spiritual music. And it's a funny thing, right? Like, why do they go together? <laughs> I don't know. It's crazy. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call it QA Plus. And this week's bonus question should you be excited about Project Hail Mary? I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, those are all the questions that we had this episode. Thank you, everyone, who put your questions into the YouTube comments, everybody who joined me for the live show, which we normally record every Monday, but I'm still on the road. We'll be back in about 10 days. So uh, when we do, I will set up the next episode, and then I hope I'll still remember how to do this work. Anyway, um, I want to talk about the sort of AI content and sort of the AI accusation and sort of what we can all do about this. I'm going to brainstorm with you. But first, I'd like to thank your patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Bear Lake Griffin, Brian Bodie, Caridwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Bailog, Sai Nielsen, Dark Finger, Dave Verbath, David Gilton, David Matz, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, James Clark, Jerry Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Marcel Smith, Michael Purcell, Nordspace, One Step for Animals.org, Paul Ravak, Brink Heidi, Richard Williams, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fowler Melly, Team 49, Telescopes Canada, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all our patrons. All your support means the universe to us. So in the last Space Bites episode that we recorded, uh, I had a few people sort of say that everything we were doing was AI. And like maybe that was just because they like disagree with our science-based reporting of various news in space and cosmology. You know, in the past, they would accuse me of being a shill for NASA or whatever, right? Um, but it, it's strange now because I think this is now being used as a pejorative against like to say this is something you don't like, I guess. Um, but you know, we're definitely entering this world now where people won't know what's real and what's AI. And, you know, right now you can still kind of tell, but like, you know, the hands in the pictures have the right number of fingers now. So we're getting pretty close. And I would like to know sort of how we navigate this, you know, as a content creator, as a journalistic uh, organization, you know, we don't use AI for any of our pictures, any of our videos, any of our text, any of the any of the stuff that we show you, any music, any of that. That's all made by human beings. And, you know, I think we're going to sort of draw that line. And that's the hill that we will die on. Uh, that if we get to the point where the content is just like, in general, AI is pumping out material that's better than what we can do, then we'll probably have to close up shop. Uh, but I don't think we'll get there soon. But until then, we're going to have stuff that is like passably good enough, plausibly good enough, and that people are going to make the accusation that what you're doing is AI. And how do we navigate this? Like I normally am the ideas guy and I don't have any ideas. I'm not really sure what we can do to navigate this very complicated, very nuanced situation. Um, and it's just going to get worse. And because YouTube is doubling down on this, right? They are putting so much tools to make AI. You can make shorts with AI. I'm sure they're going to offer music for AI. They're going to write your scripts. They're going to put in video. They're going to extend them, whatever. They're going to do all kinds of stuff, right? AI, AI, AI. What do we do? 
I don't, you know, and how do you navigate? Because I think people are going to get sick of it. I mean, we're already sick of it. And so people are going to want to go to genuine content. So like, do we just like put a big stamp on our thumbnails that says not AI? Would AI people do that? I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, uh, but I would love to know your ideas on how we navigate this future that is rushing at us at high speed. And I think, you know, trust and sort of transparency is the first thing that's going. All right, we'll see you next time.